I think one of the things you have to do first is decide that genuine relationships are necessary. I think there was a Pew Research poll done not very long ago that showed that about 75% of Americans regarded their familial and intimate relationships as the most meaningful part of their lives. And so you need to know that first, is that there probably isn't going to be anything more important to you over the course of your life than your family and your intimate relationships. And so making them of high quality, it's not optional. If you're embedded in a functional social community, so you have family members, you have friends, you have a broader community, then everyone around you is constantly reminding you how to be sane. They let you know when your jokes aren't funny. They let you know when you're too ir irritable and arrogant. And so that holds you together. It's like a marketplace. It's a distributed cognitive marketplace for sanity. And people can't tolerate isolation. It's a very rare person who can be on their own and stay together. And it's funny to think of sanity as a distributed uh, property, but it's definitely the case. Pair bonding is a fairly common strategy in the animal kingdom overall, for especially for child rearing. It seems to be the, what you might describe as the minimal viable unit. It seems to be biologically an elaboration of the same circuits that bond a mother to a child, which is often why people refer to their intimate partner as baby or honey or some diminutive. That circuit seems to have elaborated to pull in pair bonding, but it's to facilitate the long-term relationships that are necessary, I would say fundamentally, to ensure that children are raised properly and stably across time. The thing about pair bonding with someone is that even though it might be necessary, there's another element to it, and it has to do with the social distribution of sanity, is that there's lots of things wrong with you, and there's lots of things wrong with your marital partner, but hopefully if you join together, the things that are wrong can be worked out through dialogue across time, dialogue and negotiation and conflict. It's not an easy thing to do. And plus the two of you are going to have to face the vicissitudes of life. And so that mere attraction, that's love, let's say, or sexual attraction, it's not sufficient to bond you together across times of extreme difficulty. Because you'll find times in your marriage where you're not sexually attracted to one another and where you're not getting along. And so you need the community around you to say, look, you have to think about this over the decades and not over the weeks and the months, or even sometimes the years. But it's important for you to adopt the responsibility to maintain this long-term relationship because all things considered, it's better for everyone. It gives you the narrative of your life. It provides you with a companion who knows who you are. It helps you maintain your sanity because you have someone to contend to. It provides a stable environment for the raising of children. It's like the minimal necessary structure, social structure, that other complex social structures can be built upon too. But you need this society in there to say, stay together. It's an accomplishment. It's not just a responsibility and a necessity and a love affair. It's also an accomplishment. It's something you should be celebrated for. You're much more likely to get divorced if you live together beforehand. And I think part of the reason for that is that you don't get to try on people for size. Because the problem with living together is the message that it sends implicitly. People know this and living together is, well, I'll check you out and see if you're okay for me, but I reserve the right to trade you in for a better partner if someone comes along. And that doesn't work. It's an insult to some degree. It's also an arrogant insult because it assumes that you're the person who has the superior role in the relationship. I mean, both people are assuming that, but it's not a good assumption. The right assumption is that you're clueless and your partner is clueless and you both have a lot to learn and you're damn lucky you've got anyone else around and that more than that, and that to find out what that person is like and to find out what you're like, you have to go all in and you have to go all in early because otherwise there's gonna be something in reserve and marriage is so difficult that the process of conflict that puts you together as a unified pair, let's say, and then maybe as integrated people. It's so difficult that without going all in, you're just not going to manage it. And that's why not only are people who live together more likely to get divorced, but common law couples are also much more likely to separate. So when people say it's just a piece of paper, that's an unbelievably cliched and unsophisticated response to something as complicated and necessary as socially sanctioned marriage. We're already a polygamous society before marriage because 
people have sequential partners. And what happens, generally speaking, is that a small number of males have a large number of female partners. And then the vast majority of males have like virtually no partners. You can make a case for that because women should be allowed to choose whoever they want as partners. But like one of the things you see happening in the colleges where females dominate, say 70% females, you'd think the males would be making out like bandits because of the sex ratio difference. But what happens is a tiny proportion of the men attract all the women. A huge proportion of the men are just as isolated as they would be under normal circumstances. And the men who are popular have absolutely no motivation whatsoever to form a genuine relationship with any single woman. And so it doesn't work for the women because they don't get to have a relationship. They get to have a series of casual affairs with high demand men. It doesn't work for the majority of men because they don't have any relationships at all. And it turns the high demand men, I think, into psychopaths. And that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I don't think you can separate it from the rest of life, from emotional intimacy and the necessity for considering someone in their totality as a person. You don't get that with a series of one night stands. And there's no way that you can reduce sex if you have access to a lot of it to mere casual pleasure repeatedly without denigrating what it means to be a human being in terms of the women that you're sleeping with, but also with regards to yourself. If you treat someone else, some other human beings casually, repeatedly, you're telling yourself that human beings are the sorts of creatures that can be treated casually, repeatedly. And if you don't think that'll reflect on yourself, then you're not thinking. It's not a good solution, which is why across the world, cultures tend towards monogamy. It's partly because on average, that does better for everyone, but particularly for children. It doesn't hurt to try to do good things for someone as a habit. It doesn't hurt to try to tell the truth. That's probably the fundamental issue. It doesn't hurt to begin to trust someone, and that's very tightly associated with the willingness to tell the truth. The truth is what produces intimacy, it, and it obviously, because how can you have an intimate relationship that's based on either the shallowness of half-truths or lies? There can't be intimacy there. The first step is to risk trust, and I really mean that in a specific sense. Naive people trust naively and automatically because they think that people are basically good and they won't get hurt. And then everyone gets burned and burned people get cynical and then cynical people don't trust and then that's a bar barrier to int intimacy. But you can go beyond the cynicism and you have to do that. And you do that by understanding that if you put your hand out in a gesture of trust, you call to the best in that person to respond properly. And there's a big risk in that. It means to risk the trust with your eyes open, knowing that you can be betrayed, but being willing to have the courage to trust regardless. And that's the beginning of intimacy.